One Years of the Crucible on BBC Two. In the frame in a moment, the Hendry Years. Here on BBC One, the nine o'clock news and campaign report with Michael Burke. John Major's tried to heal his party's split over Europe by offering backbenchers a free vote on the single currency. Labour says the Tories are now two parties with no leader. Three IRA suspects have appeared on terrorism charges, one's accused of murdering three soldiers. And Dust Bowl Britain after the driest spring for 250 years. Good evening. John Major surprised his party and his senior cabinet colleagues today by offering Conservative backbenchers a free vote if Parliament has to make a decision on joining a single currency. It was a promise that hardened up during the day, starting off as a possibility at this morning's election news conference. Later, he said he hadn't the slightest doubt it was the way to handle the issue. The opposition parties accused him of making up policy on the hoof. Our political editor Robin Oakley reports. John Major was the focus of attention again today. It sometimes seems he is the Conservative campaign. We've come all the way from France this evening. <laughs> but the danger of pinning as much on the leader as the Tories are doing is that sometimes the officers get left behind. Mr Major was warning at a news conference earlier today that only he could be trusted to fight off plans which he brandished for a more federal Europe. But then, when asked if he'd give his fractious party a free vote on the single currency, he was surprisingly forthcoming. Of course it's a possibility as far as backbenchers are concerned. Of course it's a possibility. Uh, of course within the government, the government are bound by collective responsibility. I reiterate that point. But there's many precedents on great constitutional matters for there to be a free vote amongst backbenchers. That has been the case in the past. That's a decision to be taken nearer the time, but certainly I wouldn't rule that out. Today's strategic plan had been to put the heat on Labour, insisting that they'd run up the white flag at the Amsterdam summit and concede more powers to Europe. But as Mr Major later turned the possibility of a free vote into a probability, that became a diversion. It would really be rather odd, would it not, to say you're going to have a referendum of every adult in the country on whether to join a single currency, but then say that backbench members of Parliament are going to be degrooned in a particular way to vote. So clearly the same principle must apply to them. Mr Major admitted he hadn't consulted his pro-European Chancellor of the Exchequer about the move. I think when I was asked a question in a press conference this morning, if I had replied to the questioner and said, I'm frightfully sorry, that's a very interesting question, but I'd better go and ask Ken Clark or Joe Bloggs or somebody else about it before I give you an answer. Well, that may be the way that the Labour Party operate, but it's not the way I operate. Not that Mr Clark seemed to mind. Are you angry that you weren't consulted? Not at all. But there was confusion when the Deputy Prime Minister was interviewed later on the PM programme. Seemingly briefed only on the morning's events, he insisted no decision on a free vote would be taken until the time, years ahead. And then it was only a possibility. He, he's, not, he's not making policy on the hoof. He has said that it is a decision to be taken at the time. That's the fourth time I've told you that. Journalists were building too much on it. He was not making a policy announcement. He was answering a question. Campaigning in Wales, the Liberal Democrat leader, Paddy Ashdown, offered wounding sympathy. I feel sorry for the Prime Minister. Here he is driven to any desperate last-minute attempt in order to patch together what is basically a party in open revolt. The government is in free fall. The Prime Minister decides that it's more important to inform journalists than his cabinet colleagues. And the Tory party is at war with itself. Uh, what more do you need to know? Labour, who had no plans to give their MPs a free vote whenever it comes, called it Tory disintegration. When you have a Prime Minister and what he says is the most important issue on the economy facing the country, refusing to consult his Chancellor, and then when press says he's as likely to consult Joe Bloggs as consult Chancellor Kenneth Clark, you have all the signs of policy being made on the hoof, a party where confusion and disarray are breaking out all over the place. Tory strategists are delighted that Mr Major's move has had the rare distinction of being greeted by the party's Eurosceptics and Euro-enthusiasts alike. But ministerial confusion has been an embarrassment. With John Major flying solo, not everything has got back to base as fast as it might, and the attack on Labour never really left the ground. The opposition have been able to call it policy-making in panic. Robin Oakley, BBC News, at Conservative Central Office.
The Liberal Democrats have put health at the centre of their campaign. Paddy Ashdown told a rally in Cardiff tonight that Tory and Labour spending plans would bring the National Health Service to its knees. He condemned NHS bureaucracy, which he said had left it top-heavy and unable to cope. And on a more personal note, he announced that this evening he'd become a grandfather. Our political correspondent Carolyn Quinn is following the Ashdown campaign. Out to prove his party's policies aren't just pie in the sky, Paddy Ashdown toured the West Country and Wales today, focusing on health. <music> Intending to develop his theme at tonight's rally, there was a diversion. The news announced by the guest speaker Barry Norman that Paddy Ashdown's daughter Kate had just had his first grandchild. Thank you very much. I'm off. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Actually, I have to tell you that, after all that, I'm not sure what kind of speech I'm going to be able to deliver to you tonight. But I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing. I have more reason tonight than I've had, I think, before ever, to be proud of a party that looks not just at the next four years, but at the Britain we'll build for our children. Back in his stride, Mr Ashdown condemned the NHS under the Tories as top-heavy and management-loaded. You know, I sometimes think that if Florence Nightingale had been starting out today, she wouldn't be the lady with a lamp, she'd be the lady with a calculator. Over the last seven years, we have seen the number of administrators and managers in the NHS increase by 20,000, while the number of nurses has fallen by 50,000. Now, of course, we need a well-equipped, a well-managed health service. But just as a matter of interest, Mr. Stephen Dole, I address this question to you. When was the last time you heard someone say, is there an accountant in the house? Let me through. I am a management consultant. His party, on the other hand, had six main objectives, he said, including increasing nurse and doctor numbers, free eye and dental checks, and less bureaucracy. So how would we do it? Answer, by putting an extra five pence on the price of a packet of cigarettes to pay for free eye and dental checkups and to fund extra staff and shorter waiting lists by closing off the tax loophole exploited by the very rich to avoid paying national insurance. Trust me, said Paddy Ashdown, to deliver the health service you want. But with Labour and the Conservatives both focusing hard on health, it may simply come down to a matter of which party leader's bedside manner appeals the most. Hey! And it looks like new grandfather Paddy Ashdown will be getting some frontline practice in pretty soon. Yeah. Carolyn Quinn, BBC News, with Paddy Ashdown's campaign. Here's to you. Thank you very much indeed. All the best. Tony Blair spelled out his vision of the hopes and aims of a Labour government tonight in an off-the-cuff speech which brought his audience in Edinburgh to its feet. He warned that electing the Conservatives would give them a licence to kill the National Health Service. The Health Secretary, Stephen Dorrell, dismissed Mr Blair's comments as puerile. Our political correspondent, Carol Walker, is with the Labour leader. Tonight, Tony Blair issued a warning to the British people that if the Tories got back for a fifth term, they'd believe they had a licence to do whatever they wanted, to scrap the state pension, sell off old people's homes and put VAT on food. Perhaps above all, if they are re-elected for a fifth term, they will believe that they have a licence to kill the National Health Service as we have grown up and known it all these years and we must save the British people from that fate. After all the talk of positive campaigning, this was a savage attack on the Tories' record on the health service. He said nobody believed the Conservatives' pledge that the NHS was safe in their hands. First of all, we'll get rid of that Conservative internal market that's caused so much damage in the National Health Service. We've had enough of running it like a supermarket. It's not a supermarket, it's a public service. Tony Blair dispensed with the podium and his script to spell out his belief in the need for a change in the whole philosophy of government. He spoke of watching his children at the computer. But you sit there and you watch them and you see what a different world it is. And then you realise 
how foolish and narrow and cramped the Tory vision is that somehow there's some future for Britain as a low wage or low skill or low tech economy. You know, there's no future for Britain in that. Tony Blair said Labour was now the party of aspiration and ambition. Tony Blair is said to have been frustrated at being portrayed as lacking conviction and firm principles. Tonight he tried to inject some passion into his campaign after the weeks and months of a message of reassurance. Earlier, within sight of the Houses of Parliament at St Thomas's Hospital, Mr Blair visited yes, cancer well, patients I'm, I'm to I'm underline his commitment to reduce bureaucracy and spend £10 million helping diagnose and treat cancer patients. Some of those he visited were sceptical as to how much difference a Labour government would make. Uh, I am very worried about what you say about the fact that um, uh, you can just, as it were, save a bit on administration, which will provide enough money to do all the things. Tonight's show ended with a performance of the song which is the anthem of the campaign. Mr Blair insists he can make a difference within government spending limits. Tonight he sought to raise voters' spirits as well. Carol Walker, BBC News, Edinburgh. Well, joining me now is our social affairs editor, Neil Dixon. Pretty apocalyptic stuff from Tony Blair and from Labour today about the health service, wasn't it? Voting Tory gives them a licence to kill the NHS. They're tearing the health service apart. 14 days to save the NHS. But is their health policy really that different from the Tories? They're certainly much closer to the Conservatives than they were five years ago. Their, their central charge is exactly the same, that the Conservatives are hell-bent on privatising the NHS. The trouble is it depends what you mean by privatise. All three parties, all the main parties, are committed to a free and comprehensive service funded by taxation. And whether they achieve that or not ultimately depends on the economy. If they get the money into the Exchequer, they will spend it in that way. And the NHS will broadly manage to meet most of its commitments, as it is broadly managing to do now. If they don't, it will come under increasing strain, whoever's in power. The second meaning of this word, privatisation, though, is about contracting out some of the NHS services to the private sector. Very little of that has happened so far. Labour says an unfettered fifth term for the Tories. They will go ahead with that. The Tories deny it. But Labour do say they'll dismantle the internal market, releasing £100 million to spend on patients. That's a difference, Karen. It is a difference to the extent that they're saving on bureaucracy, they say, with this £100 million. £100 million represents about a day's spending for the National Health Service. The Liberal Democrats say they'll provide over 500 million, well that's five days spending for the National Health Service. These are not insignificant sums of money, but they're not going to turn around every hospital and surgery in the land. But uh, both opposition parties regard it almost as axiomatic that there are too many bureaucrats in the NHS and by firing uh, quite a few of them they'll make it better. Is that true? Well, there's no doubt that if you create a market, you create invoices and contracts and you push up your administration costs. On the other hand, one of the reasons why the administration numbers have gone up is because they've devolved the management down to hospitals and all the parties agree that's a good idea. There's also a slight danger, frankly, in always attacking the grey suits and saying grey suits, bad, white coats, good. It may be a ward clerk can free nurses up to provide more treatment. So cutting bureaucrats is always something people say in opposition. The Tories said it in the 1970s, and in government it looks a bit more difficult. Neil Dixon, thanks very much indeed. There's more election news later in the programme. But now the rest of the day's news. Um, news how things have changed for Britain's trade unions after 18 years of Conservative government. First over to Anne Perkins at our Westminster campaign desk for her nightly election roundup. Evening, Michael. Swamp is a national hero. Rhodes protests attract thousands of people. Yet the Green Party, dedicated to environmental issues, languishes so low in the polls it's beneath measurement. Less than 10 years after it stunned conventional politicians by winning 15% of the vote. Somewhere under here, Swampy and his mates are digging. If not for victory in the campaign against Manchester Airport's second runway, then at least for delay. Swampy has become the symbol of direct action in defence of the environment and of what he'd call the failure of conventional politics. But the Green Party fights on. It's all right talking about protecting the environment, but if you've got an economy that keeps causing ecological and social problems, then you've still got the, the problem. We're trying to get across our economic message that we can actually have a society that can create jobs without causing environmental damage. We can have a society that can be healthier without necessarily needing to spend more money on health. But for a party which struggles to organise a press conference, reconstructing the British economy seems ambitious. 
Out on the South Downs, more environmentalists gather to protest at the destruction of ancient grassland. Greens say they've fallen off the pollster's grass because of an unfair voting system. But their rows over direction and lack of organisation have become notorious too. The Green Party have got to be organised, they've got to be coherent, they've got to demonstrate that they're worth voting for. In our opinion, they're doing just that. But still, something else is holding them back politically, and we believe that that is the electoral system. To add to the Greens' problems, the mainstream parties have got greener, so the government actually accepted the Green-backed Road Traffic Reduction Act. Well, they've certainly got a few sticking plaster solutions, and I think we can take an awful lot of credit for that. But when it comes to the fundamentals of their policies, like their policies on the economy, like their policies on work, they're still not changing. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, the Manchester runway protesters expect the bailiffs to move in. They could be the Greens' best recruiting officers. In Northern Ireland, the nationalist SDLP has launched its manifesto with a renewed challenge to the IRA to declare another ceasefire. The SDLP leader, John Hume, indicated that he may not continue his dialogue with Sinn Féin unless it was clear it would bring an end to violence. SDLP and Sinn Féin candidates are fighting each other in several of the province's seats. The far-right British National Party was forced to abandon its manifesto launch when the event was disrupted by members of the Anti-Nazi League. The protesters were ejected from the room in a London hotel and the police were called in. But the event was abandoned when both groups were asked to leave. The BNP is contesting 55 seats. An opinion poll in tomorrow's Independent suggests that Labour's lead over the Conservatives has narrowed slightly, with the Liberal Democrats' support up a little. The Harris poll puts Labour on 49%, down three points on a similar survey last week. The Conservatives are up one on 31%, giving Labour an 18-point lead, down four points on last week. The Liberal Democrats are up one on 13%. The margin of error is 3%, and the poll was conducted between last Friday and Monday, before the la latest Conservative debate over Europe. The broadcaster Martin Bell isn't the only independent candidate seeking election on May the 1st. There are at least 28 others. One of the last independents to be elected to Westminster was the writer A.P. Herbert. He represented Oxford University until 1950. And even though he had no party machine behind him, he changed the law on divorce and censorship. A tireless campaigner for everything from Thames water buses to divorce reform, A.P. Herbert sat in Parliament for 15 years. Clement Attlee was still Prime Minister in 1950 when university seats were abolished and an extraordinary parliamentary career came to an end. Herbert's daughter Jocelyn says she'd like to see people like her father back in the Commons today. I don't think he liked belonging to organisations. He was a very much an individual man. Parliament is so different today. They don't seem to have great convictions or passions that they want to get done or altered they, they you know it's a, it's a job and they have to kowtow to their bosses a prolific writer and humorist in great demand as a public speaker herbert steered clear of orthodox political issues his first manifesto proudly stated for instance i know nothing about agriculture but the were causes for which he fought passionately there are so many people, you see, that uh, there are at least 614 members who had the exact answer to foreign affairs, whether it, was, whether it was Germany then or Israel now. There was only one man who thought, like I did, that I knew exactly what should be done about divorce or the betting laws or um, pet subjects like that. So what advice would A.P. Herbert have had for an independent now? If you've really got a conviction about something you believe, go ahead and fight for it and I think you'll be surprised perhaps how many people follow you because um, that's what happened to him really. Herbert reveled in eccentricity. He was the author of a story about a man who wrote a cheque to the Inland Revenue on a cow. Original minds like his were rare in Parliament 50 years ago. It remains to be seen whether there's any room for his like in an age of spin doctors and all-powerful party whips. David Walter, BBC News, Westminster.
Those calling for a more edifying campaign than we've seen so far, or you'd have been impressed by the scenes outside Conservative headquarters this morning. John Pinar reports on the three-way spat between the transport workers' leader Bill Morris, Tory tactician Alan Duncan, and a bunch of life-size teddy bears. The bears were the Hello. first to arrive, after the Tory chicken, apparently. We missed him earlier, we just need a word. But he wasn't home. Next to call round was Bill Morris of the T&G, up to no good. The Tories didn't know what was happening, but they didn't like it a bit. Bill Morris was obviously pleased with himself and his poster, which was being rude about the Tories. But then... 50% of what? The trade union recognition. Someone in the workplace, like Margaret Beckett says... There was the Tory chairman's psychic, Alan Duncan, his turn to look pleased. If you want an interview with me, I'd be delighted to give you an interview. Thank you, let's if do it now. We have the I will, I will be delighted. You I didn't will, answer on the today program. I will be delighted program. to give you an interview. At least the bears were trying to stick to the issues. What about teddy bears? Pity about the humans. We just go now. Let's do it now. Whenever you like. Enough was enough, to paraphrase the poster. I'd like you to this first. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Only two weeks more to polling day. News. Britain's longest serving party leader says he won't stand in the election. Screaming Lord Such for more than 30 years, the top hat in the monster raving loony party has abandoned the campaign to be with his mother, who's in hospital. Michael. It won't be the same. The trade unions could become a major issue in the campaign when the Scottish TUC begin their annual conference this weekend. They're calling for anti-union legislation to be repealed and for a commitment to full employment. The Conservatives say they'll press on with union reforms. Unlike Labour, they're promising to remove the union's legal immunity, allowing businesses to sue them if they disrupt essential public services like the Royal Mail. The Conservatives reject setting a minimum national wage and wouldn't sign up to the European Social Chapter, which governs work conditions. Labour says it'll retain the key elements of Conservative trade union reforms from the 1980s, but it says firms should recognise a union where employees vote for one. Labour would introduce a minimum national wage, although it hasn't set a level. Unlike the Conservatives, Labour would adopt the social chapter. The Liberal Democrats stressed the need for building partnerships at work, which would give employees greater rights of consultation. They would introduce widespread employee share ownership and profit sharing, and would adopt the social chapter if it promotes employment and competition. The Scottish National Party says it'll bring in a charter for trade unions, setting out their rights and responsibilities, and it would set a minimum wage at half the average national rate earned by male workers. The Welsh Nationalist Party, Plaid Cymru, says it would have a trade union rights enshrined in a Bill of Rights and would introduce a minimum wage of £4 an hour. Our industry correspondent John Fryer examines how far the unions have changed since the Conservatives took office in 1979 and the future of union legislation. Winter 79. Dustmen on strike, bins overflowing. Ambulances corralled behind pickets. The dead left unburied. The battle with the Labour government etched into folklore. Margaret Thatcher swept to power in its wake. Now, she says, the unions are flexing their muscles again, this time against Tony Blair. Trade unions have lined up to him and demanded new legislation. And Mr Blair's response to the demand from the trade unions? Surrender. One veteran of the winter of discontent is John Ruff, on strike for 13 weeks. These days, the bins in Camden, North London, aren't collected by the council, but a private contractor. Maggie Thatcher was very clever. She broke the union by dividing them. You were frightened of losing your job all the time. She got it sort of um, into everyone's head that if you didn't work, you didn't have a job. And uh, if you followed the unions, then you definitely wouldn't have a job. To discover how much John Ruff's experiences are echoed elsewhere, we set off for an overview of industrial Britain. Labour says Baroness Thatcher is just scaremongering, not least because the landscape's been transformed. With the unions on the defensive, strikes have all but died out. Birmingham. Down there is the Rover car factory. In the days when it was British Leyland, it became a byword for shop floor militancy, regularly crippled by wildcat strikes. But that's all old hat. 
nobody can strike now without a secret ballot, and neither Labour nor the Liberal Democrats go into this election opposed to that. Rover hasn't had an official strike for a decade. Labour's committed to retaining most of the Tories' union laws, though the party will give unions a new right to recognition if a majority of workers vote in favour. But the Tories have exploited the lack of detail on how the idea would work in practice. Jeff Armstrong was personnel director at British Leyland in the 80s. Now head of an employer's training organisation, he says statutory recognition would backfire. It seems to me we'd be going straight down the wrong rabbit hole if we were to take ourselves back into unworkable procedures for statutory recognition, which very nearly blew us out of the water in the 1970s when we tried them then. They were a major source of dispute and contentiousness in their own right. That is not the positive agenda for positive industrial relations that we need to go forward on. I'm keen to ensure that we don't get into positions where adversarial industrial relations again dominate the national scene. It didn't do anybody any good in the 1970s. It wouldn't do us any good in the next uh, millennium either. But unions have got an important part to play in ensuring a combination of fairness, good performance, and decent standards of people at work for people at work. But on our trip, we discovered that the Tories' own plans for more union reforms are no less controversial. In a move regarded as a bridge too far by some employers, they'll make it harder for unions in essential services to strike. There are few services more essential than this. The post bus is run by Royal Mail, but the driver doesn't just collect letters, he takes passengers too, a vital lifeline in rural areas. The Tories say that strikes in monopoly businesses like Royal Mail have a disproportionate effect and those who are hit should have the right to sue for damages. The mail's just as essential in the cities. Businesses depend on it and say that even after a one-day strike it takes two weeks to clear the backlog and there's no compensation. We are held to ransom every time there is a strike in this country and that cannot be right. So it's the disproportionate effects of that strike on our business that I'm particularly concerned with, not the principles of striking itself. It was last year's wave of strikes in the Royal Mail, the London Underground and the Fire Service which prompted the Tories to propose yet more changes to employment law. But unions in essential services say the plans are motivated by electoral considerations, not industrial logic. Even the Institute of Directors, hardly a moderate organisation, says that the government proposals on strikes are nonsense. A new government has to listen to uh, business leaders, it has to listen to trade unions, it has to listen to anybody who has intelligent advice about what's going on in industry. Our journey takes us on to Draycott Reservoir in Warwickshire. It's all tranquility here now. A far cry from 1982, when Britain's water workers took on and beat Margaret Thatcher in a fight over pay. That simply couldn't happen now. Since the water industry was privatised, the regional companies make their own local deals. There's no national agreement, so there can't be a national strike. Not just here, but in a host of other privatised industries. But pay for those workers left in the public sector will still pose a challenge to whichever party wins the election. Both Tories and Labour are committed to existing spending targets, meaning a tight clamp on rises in the National Health Service and local government. So the potential for discontent is there. Our tour has revealed the extent of the upheaval which has refashioned the structure and nature of the workplace. So, back to the man on the Camden dust cart. John Ruff says he doesn't want to see a return to the old days. But I don't want us to be bombastic and uh, force people and say, well, we're the union, you've got to do this. I hope that they can sit down, negotiate and bring a fair living to a fair working man. The Tories say the unions have been silent in this election, but they'll expect a payback for helping fund Labour's campaign. Tony Blair promises them partnership, not conflict, but no favours. Nonetheless, though spring 1997 is a world away from winter 79, the union issue has returned to the hustings yet again.
And the main election news tonight. John Major has taken cabinet colleagues by surprise and offered his backbenchers a free vote on the single currency. The opposition accuse him of making policy on the hoof. I'm joined now by our political editor, Robin Oakley. John Major flying solo was how you put it. Uh, Robin, did he stall? Did he crash? Was it the shambles the opposition parties are making out? He didn't stall or crash, but he did show the high risk of the Tories pinning so much hope on him and putting him so much out in the front because he is operating pretty well on instinct now uh, and he did undoubtedly make policy on the hoof today. He hardened up his line on the single European currency free vote as he went along, as he faced the pressure of journalists' questions. It took them quite a while for other ministers really to catch up with what was going on. And of course there is a weakness in this position because he didn't actually give his MPs a free vote on Maastricht, on the Maastricht Treaty, uh, when he was trying to push that through. And people are saying he's only doing this now because he's forced to out of weakness. Has it ended up clear, will Tory MPs, backbench MPs, get a free vote on the single currency or not? It's still hedged around with a few reservations, but there is no way, after the words he's used today, that if the Tories come under a John Major government to introduce a single currency, to introduce that issue into the Commons, there would have to be a free vote. Has all this uh, managed to distract uh, interest, though, from, from what the opposition parties, the issues the opposition parties want to concentrate on? Well, I don't think so. Not with the kind of performance we saw from Tony Blair tonight. He made a tremendous uh, speech of great conviction, uh, particularly focused on the health service, which is a great issue for Labour. Mr Blair has been very resentful of this impression that he's only a safety-first politician telling him what the focus groups tell him it's safe to say. Labour promised us at the weekend we were going to see more of the, the passionate side of Mr Blair, some of his his real conviction. He made a speech tonight like one he made at the TUC a couple of years ago when he was in trouble with that speech and he threw away his notes and he just let rip. He was doing the same sort of thing tonight, striding about the stage, speaking with real passion, talking about there being only 14 days left to save the NHS. This was a different kind of Mr Blair, reacting to the kind of audiences he's been getting in this election. We've seen this happen to politicians before. He's up and flying now too. Well, OK, thanks very much indeed. And that's all from the 9 o'clock news tonight. Good night. On election questions.